Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. These words from our Gospel reading this morning, the Gospel according to St. John in the the first chapter, the 14th verse, these words, perhaps better than any others, summarize what Christmas is all about. Last night at our Christmas Eve service, we heard the story about how it all happened, how how the Savior was born, the shepherds and the angels and all that kind of stuff, the stable and the manger, all that. But today from the Gospel of John, we hear the explanation, what it all means. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. With these words, John is telling us that the Word of God that was in the beginning with God when God made the heavens and the earth, the Word of God through whom the world and everything in it was made. After all, remember, God made everything by saying, let there be, and there was. With his words, he created. The Word of God that was with God in the beginning and through whom he made everything that was made. The Word of God who was and is, in fact, God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, has taken on flesh, skin and bones, just like you and me, and has come to dwell or to live among us. That's what this all means. That's what we're, we're celebrating. Now, there's another translation of the Bible that I'm kind of fond of. Uh, it's a different translation than what we normally use in church, in our services. And it's one that says things in a little bit more of an informal kind of way and says, likes to say things in a way that's a little bit thought-provoking to kind of stir up the, the thoughts of our imaginations a little bit. And I like the way that it... it, it translates this particular verse of the Bible. Instead of simply saying the word became flesh and dwelt among us, this translation of the Bible says the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. Now, last year on Christmas Day, and some of you were there last year on Christmas Day, I know that, Last year on Christmas Day, I preached a sermon on that different translation of this verse. And if you don't remember that, that's okay. I hardly remember the sermons I preach sometimes too. And Christmas Day last year was a long time ago. But I preached last year on Christmas Day about this different translation of this Bible verse and how remarkable it is to think that Jesus, the, the Word of God made flesh, would come and live in neighborhoods. Neighborhoods like ours. And would take people like us, sinners though we are, to be his neighbors. It really is a remarkable thing. Since last year, however, I've had plenty of time to do some thinking about these things, and I'm wondering if saying that the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood doesn't quite take things far enough. I still like that particular translation of this Bible verse, I still think it makes a good point. But I wonder if there's more to it than that. After all, Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, comes to be more than a neighbor, doesn't he? Over this last year, we've seen, rather dramatically actually, that we can be cut off from our neighbors rather quickly. A pandemic rolls around and then bang, we're all locked away from our neighbors and we hardly hear from them from days and weeks on end. Perhaps our neighbors even end up avoiding us because they're afraid of what might happen if they come in too close of contact with us. But that's not how it is with Jesus, the Word made flesh, is it? He's not some neighbor who lives next door, some neighbor who might cut us out of his life and completely avoid us. He lives much closer than that. He comes and lives in our very own homes. Not just in the house next door, but in our very own homes. 
That's the picture that all of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us of Jesus. He's someone who comes and lives in the homes of the people who believe in him. The the Bible seems to tell us that Jesus didn't really have a home of his own. It wasn't just on Christmas Eve when there was no place for them in the inn that Jesus didn't have a place. It was throughout his life. Jesus, as an adult, said, foxes have holes and birds have their nests, but the Son of Man, he himself, Jesus says, has no place to lay his head. And he didn't say that complaining. It was just a statement of the fact. He didn't have a home that he lived in. Not of his own, anyways. He lived in the homes of his people. And that's demonstrated beautifully time and time again throughout the Gospels. On one instance, we're told that Jesus is living in Peter's house. You know, Peter, that kind of leader of the disciples. And he's living there in Peter's house, which is in a place called, was in a place called Capernaum. And Jesus had spent the morning teaching in the synagogue there in Capernaum. And later on that day, he was back at Peter's house when all of a sudden Peter's mother-in-law, mother-in-law, who also happened to live in that house, came down with a fever. And Jesus, right then and right there, he healed her, cast the fever out of her. Jesus was there, right there in Peter's house to heal and to save. And this is, like I said, this is just the repeated picture throughout the Gospels. Luke, in his Gospel, especially loves to show us how Jesus comes to the homes of people. Luke, in his Gospel, tells us about Jesus coming to the home of Mary and Martha. Remember that story? Martha being busy with the the cleaning and preparing, trying to make her house ready for a place that Jesus would come to and trying to be a good host, welcoming him into her home. But then Jesus, instead, inviting her simply to sit down and listen the way that Mary was, right there in her own living room, he taught them. Luke also tells a story about a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was was a tax collector, a rather uh, unlikable fellow who extorted a lot of money from a lot of people. But when Jesus came into Jericho one day, which was the city in which Zacchaeus lived, he walked right up to Zacchaeus, who had climbed up into a tree so that he could see Jesus. Jesus walked right up to Zacchaeus and looked at him up there in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, I must come stay at your house today. And Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house, and Jesus' presence in Zacchaeus' house was a life-changing thing. Zacchaeus pledged that he would give back fourfold Anything that he had taken unfairly from anyone in his work as a tax collector, Jesus, coming to Zacchaeus' house, changed Zacchaeus' life forever. There's more examples of this throughout the Gospels, more, many more, actually, and there's more than I could probably list here in a reasonable amount of time. But I think you get the point. Jesus is not an arm's length, next door neighbor kind of guy. He's not your neighbor who likes to chat over the fence from time to time when you both happen to be out in the backyard. Jesus is a guy who comes right into your house and lives in your house with you. So I wonder if a better way to translate these words from the Gospel of John, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, might be to say, the Word became flesh and moved into our homes. I don't know about you, but I find the idea of Jesus coming and living in my home both comforting and concerning. As we sit here today on the, on the precipice of another lockdown, we're not going to have church for a while again after today, with the prospect of being isolated from neighbors again and not being able to go out for essential purposes, it's comforting to know that Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, is close at hand. He's right there in our homes. He's not far off. He's not stuck in some building that we aren't allowed to go to. He's right there. He's with us in our homes, with us in a lockdown, with us even when we feel utterly alone. That's a comforting thought. 
At the same time, however, the thought of Jesus being in my home is also somewhat concerning. There are things that happen in my home that I'm not entirely sure I want Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, to see. Things I do that I'm not particularly proud of. Words I say that I wouldn't want Jesus to hear. Our homes are the places where we are the most comfortable, and they're often the places where the worst comes out of us. The thought of Jesus being there then, the thought of Jesus seeing and hearing all of that, it's a little concerning. But that's when we need to remember why Jesus comes to be there in our homes. Why he has taken on human flesh and come to dwell among us. John tells us, Again, in this reading today, he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, moved into our homes, and we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, comes and dwells among us, comes and moves right into our homes to reveal the glory of God the Father to us. And what is the glory of God the Father? It's not just that, that, that great shining glory of heaven itself that terrified the, the shepherds that first Christmas night. It's not just the impressive display of God's power and might that you find in some of those Old Testament stories, like when the people of Israel are at Mount Sinai and the earth is shaken and the people are afraid. That's the glory of God too, but the real glory of God is his glory that comes to forgive. The real glory of God is the cross. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem, and once he had made it into the city of Jerusalem, he prayed to God his Father out loud in front of everyone. He said, Father, glorify your name. In other words, he was already speaking about that cross thing that was going to happen at the end of the week. He says, Father, glorify your name. And God the Father responded right then and there for everyone to hear. And he said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Right there on the cross. And win forgiveness, life, and salvation for all these people. The word became flesh and dwelled among us, moved into our homes, and we have seen his glory, John says. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace. And truth, grace to forgive our sins, each and every one of them. Rightly understood then, Jesus coming and dwelling with us in our homes is no reason to be concerned at all. It's good news through and through. Having said that, however, I still wonder if we're not quite taking things far enough. Is it enough? to say that Jesus comes to live with us in our homes? Or does Jesus go farther than that still? Earlier in the service this morning, we sang that beloved Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And we sang these words, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. With those words, we asked Jesus to do a lot more than just move into our house, didn't we? We asked him to move into our hearts. And our hearts, just like our homes, are places where there are things that we might not want Jesus to see. But that's why we pray him, pray and ask him to cast out our sin and enter in. And that's what he does. In fact, we watched him do it this morning for Samantha. He, in holy baptism, Jesus came, cast out her sin, and entered in. He was born in her today. She is a house 
in which Jesus dwells. And you, all of you who have been baptized into Jesus' name, you are the same. You are a house. Your heart is a house in which Jesus dwells. And in case you don't believe me, he's going to prove it to you again later in this service today. When you come forward and receive that, that bread and that wine, that body and blood, he comes into you today again, casting out your sin and entering in, being born in you today. Jesus just keeps doing that. He keeps moving closer and closer. Even when we're not able to go to church, he moves in closer with his grace and truth, his mercy to forgive and save, confronting the sins that are there in our homes and in our hearts and forgiving them by his death and resurrection. It doesn't just happen here at church. It happens in our homes too, which is important to remember as we head into this lockdown thing. Jesus is there. And he's working there, and he's here in our hearts, and he's working there too. Every time we crack open his word and read it, every time we pray and call upon him in prayer, he comes closer and closer still. What I've learned since last Christmas is that it's hard even to imagine, let alone put into words, just what it means that Jesus... The Word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, has come to dwell among us. It's hard even to wrap your mind around that. Thanks be to God, however, that we don't have to understand it. Instead, this Christmas Day, we simply rejoice in it. The Word has become flesh, has moved into our neighborhoods, has moved into our homes, has moved into our hearts, and dwells among us even now. He is Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life that is everlasting. Amen.